morning, Pennington. My name's Morgan, and our scripture reading for today is from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, reading from the ESV. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant, to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Morgan, uh, for reading this morning. It has been um, a delight in order to put together lists and see those of you in the church body reading out the scripture and taking part in this together. A reminder again, um, all of us are the body of Christ and all of us are the Holy Spirit working through his church. Not just me because I preach up here, but each and every one of us is a part of what is happening on Sunday mornings. Um, I also was asked just to give a little encouragement. It's fun to see the start of the year and new friends come and be a part of and visit. Um, And it was actually almost just a year ago that a former church member, elder at our church, um, who had moved and retired down to uh, South Carolina, had a stroke. Um, And many of you gathered around and prayed and sent tons of loving texts. And Jeff Lawrence, who is actually visiting with us today, asked if I would just Um, thank the church body for their love and care and affection for him. Um, And you can also talk to him and see that he is doing very, very well. And you can connect with him after service as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, A bit of a reminder of what we are preaching through this Hebrew series, that because of Christ Jesus, we are a community. We are more than that. We are a family brought together by him and in our trust of Jesus. That's the more serious side, but I started last week with a few jokes that were terrible, and I got such an overwhelming feedback from all of you about starting that way, and some of you literally sent me Facebook messages and DMs more biblical jokes. So we're going to ride this this horse as far as we can. So I have a couple jokes set up this morning. Is that all right? It's not a family Sunday. There's no kids in the room, but uh, we're going to read some jokes, okay? And if you're mad at me, you sent these to me. Okay. First one, we'll start off our through thread of all of this. If it's your first Sunday here, you weren't here last week. How does Moses brew his coffee? He brews it. Oh, man, how does he make it? No. Oh, it's a terrible start. Okay. It's not going to get any better. It was pointed out to me last week uh, that Nehemiah is not the shortest person in the Bible because there's Bildad, the shoe height. Yep, that's the right reaction. Okay. Why couldn't Jonah trust the ocean? He suspected there was something fishy about it. (laughs) Yeah, that one's almost too good, actually. All right. I'm going to end it with another lame one. Okay. Who was the greatest financier in the Bible? Noah. He was floating his stock while everyone was in liquidation. Yeah. Gross. Okay. Uh, A little bit of background. If you're new with us in the Hebrews series, or just to reiterate, uh, Hebrews is a letter in the New Testament. We do not know the author of Hebrews. They don't ascribe themselves. It's tough to know. The language is different from Paul's letters or others. And so we do know that it has an incredibly pastoral tone to it. So many times people refer to the author of Hebrews as simply the pastor who's pastoring their congregation, pastoring their flock during a difficult time. Most likely the letter is written towards the end of the first century, somewhere around 70 to 80 AD. Uh, And this is about 30 or 40 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. In this 30 or 40 years, the Christian movement has grown. It's been spreading all throughout Rome. People are sharing the story. Jewish uh, Israelites are sharing the story, becoming followers of Jesus. It's actually even known as a sect of Judaism. These are the, the people who follow that, that preacher, Jesus, the one who was crucified, and it's known as this movement. 
it is now starting to impact culture. Jews are becoming uh, hostile towards family members who are taking on this new identity of being Christ followers. It's impacting the economics of idol worship in Rome. They're not selling as many statues. And so now Rome, because of the economic impact, is also now persecuting Christians. They also found if you were a leader in Rome, if you were emperor of Rome, they were also a really easy scapegoat for any problems happening in Rome. There's a food shortage. It's the Christians. They're taking all of it. Um, There is a plague happening. It's the Christians. They're not worshiping our gods as much anymore. So persecution of Christians became ramped up greater and greater. Most likely, when this letter is written, is during under one of the greatest persecution of Christians under an emperor named Nero. And so Christians, Jewish Christians in particular, are faced with a dilemma. I am being persecuted for my faith. I may die because I am a follower of Christ. But I have an easy out where I can just go back to being a a Jewish Israelite again. I can just drop the Jesus stuff, go back to Moses, go back to Abraham, go back to the law, and all of these problems are going to go away. And the pastor writes this imploring letter who says, you can't take a step into Jesus and go back. You can't embrace Jesus and then go back. There's nothing like Jesus if Moses is, is someone who shared of the law. Jesus is the one the law comes from. Abraham is the patriarch, but Jesus is the father of all. You can trust in the physicality of earth and the future of heaven, but Jesus is how God created heaven and earth. He is not your problem. He is your solution to your persecution. There are two main themes all throughout Hebrews, and we'll see them chapter after chapter as we study this book. It is one, Jesus is worthy of glory and honor and trust. He is so good. He is so gracious. He is so beautiful. Second is hold on to that faith in Jesus. It doesn't just happen to you. You have a part to play in this. Let's review last week very quickly. Last week, we looked at Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, and we shared we can trust Jesus. We can trust Jesus because of two things the pastor writes. Number one, he is powerful. He's God himself, which means he is capable and powerful. You can bring any problem to Jesus. He can handle it. He's God. Number two, Jesus is human, and that means he understands. He understands what it's like to go through the struggles we go through, the problems we go through. He has compassion on us. So he is capable and he is compassionate. This makes me think, honestly, of... Action Park in northern New Jersey. My wife grew up going to Action Park. It is now Mountain Creek Water Park. It is the most dangerous water park in the United States, in this backwaters part of New Jersey. It is so bad that there is a documentary on Netflix about the dangers of Action Park. They had a water slide that literally does a loop. In your body, in water, you did a loop. Their insurance adjuster came, saw it, and said, immediately, you have to shut down right now. They cannot have a loop in a water slide. It was also so bad that, and I have not watched it, and I do not endorse it, they made a fictional movie about Action Park starring Johnny Knoxville. That's the kind of feel of Action Park. There have been few thrills in my life. I love roller coasters. I've been to a million water parks. I love adventure and adrenaline. Water Action Park is the scariest water park I've ever been to. It's the only one, and I went as an adult at 27, and it's the only water park that literally took my breath away of like, this is crazy. There is a rope swing that is like 30 feet high, looks like it was built by a bunch of college students, and is just filled, no offense, CCNJ crew, but I don't want you building a rope swing for me. And unless you're an engineer, maybe if you're last year. And then in it, it's filled from a, a creek. So a creek fills a giant pit, and they have a 30-foot rope that doesn't look like it's been maintained in years. I swung on that rope swing, and there's a moment in it where you say, can I trust this rope? Can I trust that wooden beam that looks like it has not been maintained or checked or inspected? Can I trust this rope that looks really too old and too frayed to carry me in it? There's this question. Can I trust this rope? The second question then is, 
Can I be trusted to hold on to this rope myself? Am I capable of carrying almost 200 pounds on just my arms alone on this rope swing? If you've ever been to a water park, you know the joy of watching those who cannot carry themselves on a rope swing and they either just slide down it and slam into the water or immediately they just fall face first. They can't hold their weight. This is the juncture point of where we are in Hebrews. He's saying Jesus is this rope. It's trustworthy. You can hold on to Jesus. It is not Action Park built sketchy without any evaluation by insurance. He is a rope that you can hold on to. He's trustworthy. He's capable. You can hold it. But then he says, but it's not just that the rope is trustworthy. It's can you hold on to it? Are you strong enough? Can you maintain your grip on the rope of Christ Jesus? Can you hold on when the pressure mounts? Hebrews 1 and 2 is the pastor arguing why Jesus is trustworthy. Hebrews chapter 3, he pivots, and now he says, Jesus is trustworthy. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to maintain your grip under pressure? How are you going to hold on, not just in a moment, but throughout your lifetime? And in Hebrews chapter 3, let's look at three pieces of encouragement as the author tells us, hold on to Jesus. Hold on to Jesus. He's trustworthy, but you got to hold on. What am I to do? Okay, Jesus is powerful. Jesus is compassionate. But, but pastor, I'm drowning over here. And I know that Jesus is capable, but how, how do I take that head knowledge you're talking about, that I'm reading about, how do I bring it into my actual life? How does what I'm hearing enter into my spirit and my heart? How does this give me comfort or peace or joy in moments where I don't feel like I have them? This week, we're going to see in Hebrews chapter 3, three ideas about holding on to Jesus. First, that faith is declared. The, one of the powers is declaring it, confessing it, declaring it to each other. Second is allowing our faith to be tested, to withstand the pressure of life. And third, that our faith is present. It is not a future reality that we hope for only. It is a present reality of Christ alive and at work in us. As Morgan read so beautifully in Hebrews 3, 1 through 6, first verse, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus. Not just a passive phrase, but the language is a little more direct than just consider or think about. It's meditate on, declare, remind, study Jesus, who he is. The apostle and high priest of our confession that we confess Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. And then verse 6, that we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope in Christ Jesus. In this middle of the passage, he has this whole part about Moses. He's furthering his points from chapters 1 and 2. He's saying to Jewish Christians, you respect Moses. Moses brought the law, the Ten Commandments. Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and formed us into a new nation. He led us through the desert. And you hold the pride to the religion of the law Moses gave. He said, but isn't the one who created the law more important than the one who brought it to you? Isn't the one who tells us what is good and true, what morality is, more important than the systems we build from him? Isn't it better to know the one who created good than to know what is good? Faith is declared. I want to talk about something called a positive confession. We have a familiarity with a negative confession. We know kind of what that is. That's confessing the wrongs, our sins, our failures. We confess those one to another. Some examples of negative confession. I lost your favorite earrings. I'm confessing this. I'm sorry. I lost them. They're gone. I broke the window throwing baseballs in the house. Even though you specifically told me not to do that, I still did it. I broke the window. I'm confessing this to you. I should not have brought dinosaurs back to life using DNA trapped in amber, and I should not have used frog DNA to fill in the gaps because, as I learned, life uh, finds a way. That's John Hammond's confession. I'm sorry I lost trust and I lied to you. I'm sorry you were looking to rely on me, and I wasn't there for you. There's power in negative confession. 
Incredible power. Scripture says this. James 5, 16 says, confess your sins one to another and you will be healed. There's power in confessing our sins. I have failed. I am weak. I am broken. Coming before each other. Even last week, we talked about the power of saying, um, I've been through this as well. I've also gone here. I've also failed here to confess our sins to each other. But in Hebrews 3, he's talking about a different confession, a different form of declaring. Not a negative confession, I have failed, but a positive confession something I believe, something I trust, something I stand on. We who are brought together by Jesus have a calling and our faith is empowered by, our ability to hold on is fueled by a regular confession of what and who we believe in. The regular declaration to each other that it's Jesus only, man. It's Jesus who gives me strength. It's the beauty of who he is. It's coming into his presence. It's declaring that one to another, speaking it out loud into reality. Yes, I believe this. We shared actually this in my small group this week. If you're not in a small group, I encourage you to join one. It has been the biggest encouragement of finding friends and sharing life for Kate and I in any of our church experiences. But even this last week, we talked about lifting our hands in worship And that if you come to faith as a teenager, you can lift your hands when you're at a youth conference, but if you're in church and your parents are in the rows behind you, there's a bit of like, I don't want my parents to like see, I don't don't see me buying into all this, see me being vulnerable in this, declaring this. My parents see me every single week. In other words, one of the keys to faith in Jesus is regularly declaring the vulnerable statement that this is what I believe in. This is who I have put my trust in. I believe in this reality. A positive confession is telling people what is true about your beliefs and how you view the world. It it is an act of faith in and of itself that I'm gonna speak something I truly believe in my heart about humans, about eternity, about life, about creation, about eternity. This is something I believe and I'm speaking a vulnerable statement that I have placed my trust in this. Yes, I do believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that God raised him from the dead. It's an act of faith to speak that out loud, to declare and to confess that belief. Yes, I do believe that all God's purposes and promises came true in Jesus and that God is good. Yes, I do belong to the family that Jesus regards as his brothers and his sisters. The positive confession of this is what I believe in. In church settings, this is what creeds do. When you read out a Nicene Creed or a a Constantinople Creed um, or the Westminster Shorter Catechism, these statements that church leaders thousand years ago put together and we state them together. If you're in a church that reads out creeds, they read it out loud together and it's a coming together moment. If you're in a small group and you're doing an inductive Bible study, the application portion is a joint confession in what we believe. It's a positive confession. Yes, I believe that this scripture is true. This is how I see it playing in my life. It is the first third of service. It is why we come together and we start every service in song. It's why we sing three, maybe four songs together. It's why it's important that we sing it out loud. It's why you see some of us with physical demonstrations of hands out or hands raised. It is a positive confession of, yes, this is who I believe my God to be. This is who we believe our God to be. And this is how I am going to respond to him. It is a positive declaration of faith. How do I hold on to my faith? I speak it into reality. I declare it together. This is who Jesus is, and this is how I will follow him. It's what baptism is. It's the power of communion. It's declaring our belief in Jesus. Either we believe that God's new world has come to birth in Jesus, and it's there waiting for us, living and active around us, solid and definitive 
which means we can be bold in living and acting on that basis, and we can make confident claims about it, or we're struggling to understand what Christianity really is, how it works, who Jesus Christ is. The author of Hebrews, in a few chapters, turns up the heat and says, if you can't even declare this, are you even following Jesus? If you're not owning this with others, what are you doing? He says, the people who make up this house, of people who declare this faith, he says, are confidently speaking this in their context. Why are we sometimes unwilling to state our beliefs? Why is it sometimes hard to sing the words as we're being led? Why is it hard sometimes to raise a hand in surrender? Why is it hard every time I'm getting a haircut and they ask me what I do and I have to say I'm a pastor and I know the next questions that are coming? Why is it hard in those moments to speak with confidence how we believe this world is made and where our hope comes from in Christ Jesus? To the early church under persecution, the pastor writes, declare to each other that you trust in Jesus. Remind each other that he is good. His character, his power, his work of salvation, and the promise of life now and in eternity. To us, we're not under persecution. It's where we kind of diverge from Hebrews. Um, We are under the problematic nature of apathy and distraction and chaos. That is our challenge as the pastor writes to us. And to this same remedy is the declaration of what we believe, the positive confession of who Jesus is. It's to cut through the chaos and to remind ourselves how we see this world, how we see the God who made it, how we see ourselves. There are a lot of things telling us who we are in the current world. It's happening every second of every day, of every moment. I get alerts on my phone. Google's trying to guess what ads I want to read. Sometimes it nails me. Oh, a story about Federer retiring and Nadal is crying. Well, you got me, Google. All right, but in it, we are desperately searching for who we are. We have so many forces telling us you're not enough unless it's posted on the internet. You're not enough unless others can see it and affirm it and like it and share it, you're not enough unless others are also agreeing that you're enough, and you're pretty enough, and you're doing enough exciting things, and the sunflowers look perfect in your photo. To the early church, I mean, we are not enough unless we own the newest phone, we have the newest comfort, we're moving forward in the newest purchase, and item, and kitchen gadget, and whatever makes our life complete. We are not enough unless we are sexy, smarter, and vote the right way, despise the right people, believe in the right causes. Regularly and often, we need to, in order to hold on to Christ, declare to each other why we are enough, why our lives have value, why you matter and are worthy of love because of Christ Jesus, our loving and wonderful Savior, who was God, who is human, who is resurrected from the grave. Continuing in Hebrews chapter 3, we declare it. Faith is declared. Second, faith is tested. The author continues, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your father put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and I said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you at all evil, unbelieving hearts, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. The pastor is quoting from Psalm 95, a psalm reflecting on the Israelites in the desert. And in it, God is, if I'm giving uh, marriage counseling, God is using language I usually tell couples not to use. He's saying, you always and you never. He's really being hyperbolic, but I also love that God cares and is emotional. Back to the theme of holding on again. We see it in verse 13 and 14. 
Encourage each other. Hold on fast. Hold to the original confidence. We have come to share in Jesus. Declare that faith and trust while you can. Hold on to it firm until the end. Before he quotes Psalm 95 and is reflecting on the failure of the Israelites, he is encouraging once again to hold fast. Here he says, faith is tested. It's tested through time and trial. Anyone can sing a song one time. Anybody can in an emotionally charged service or retreat or convention or prayer moment declare with their mouth, come and pray a prayer. I think the pastor of Hebrews would say, why don't you talk to me when you've done that every week for 20 years? Why don't you talk to me after months of walking through a painful and scary doctor diagnosis? Why don't you talk to me when you've lived life with others and been betrayed and hurt and still cling to forgiveness, grace, and love? He says, it is not just the one moment of our life. While powerful moments when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Christ Jesus is Lord, the author of Hebrews says, yes, that is transformative. He says, but let me see how your life flows from there. Can you declare that faith, that trust, day in and day out, week after week, month after month, year after year? And I think he would argue that faith is not really faith until it is tested. It's just a belief. It's just an idea. It becomes faith when the idea is pressed and pushed. The pastor shares Psalm 95 because the Israelites trusted in God when it was easy and obvious. Oh, you're going to set us free from Egypt? Sure, we trust you. You're the best. As we're leaving, they're going to take all of their gold and give it to us, so we're going to leave with all of their wealth? Of course, yeah, we trust in you. You're going to part the sea and we're going to walk through it? Of course, yeah, you're the best. The sea is going to collapse on top of them and you're going to destroy our enemies? Yeah, great, this is awesome. But then I'm going to starve in a desert for 40 years. I'm going to walk into the promised land and there's going to be giants twice as tall as me. Or my personal favorite, Moses is going to go up to the mountain and then he's going to take too long. I don't know if I could trust you then. I don't know if you're very good then. Faith becomes faith when it is tested. The Israelites' faith was tested and couldn't hold up in the desert. This is a theme of the Old Testament. The early church's faith, the pastor is writing to them, their faith is being tested right now in a very real way. I trust in Jesus. Jesus is good. He is Savior. He is Lord over heaven and earth, and he is Lord over my life. He will provide eternity for me. I believe that if I die in this world, there is resurrection waiting for me. And then a Roman guard says, come, we are going to take your life. Do I believe it now? There was a debate in 325 AD over whether priests who recanted of their faith once it was safe to believe, were they allowed to come back? Would we even let them back in? Do I trust in my faith when I'm losing my family? That God says he will provide a spiritual family for me, but I'm losing my biological family, I'm losing my ethnicity for this decision. Do I still trust in this Jesus? We have faith in a lot of things. Faith is not just a Christian principle. Faith is how we live our life. We have faith in many things. I have faith in myself, my capabilities, my intelligence, my ability to withstand or think my way through or be responsible. Faith in the goodness of humanity, that I'm going to trust others and care and hope that they're going to get my back. Faith in the church as an institution, that the church is going to do what they say, be there, never let me down. And if you live long enough on earth, you will find yourself disappointed or at moments of crisis of faith in these things. Faith in myself, but my body does things I can't control or stop or understand. A microscopic virus is going to run throughout the entire world, and our greatest scientists don't know how to stop it. We don't know. 
I put my faith in a person and they let me down. People have put their faith in me and I've let them down. I'm working through graduate school and in one of our classes we had to share our faith journey. Um, and the faith journey of so many people in graduate school, in ministry already, for many of them were stories of the church letting them down and having to work their way through that again. I am not a savior. Humanity is not a savior. The church itself is not savior. Jesus Christ is savior, and Jesus Christ is savior alone. And he's good enough, and he's capable. But I, that faith in Jesus can be tested. Jesus, you say you care about justice, but this situation doesn't seem fair. What are you doing? Jesus, you say you are a provider, but I am struggling financially, and I'm struggling to provide for my children What's going on? Jesus, you say that you love me, but in this moment of my life, I'm still not married. I don't have any kids. I feel very alone. Am I worthy of love? I don't feel it. Jesus, you say you are a healer, but I'm sick and I don't see my body getting better. How do we walk through those faith journeys and those faith testings? I think the pastor of Hebrews would tell us, hold on and see what Christ will do on the other side. I can't necessarily give you evidence in the moment, but I can give you evidence of the past. And the evidence of the past is that God promised a Savior, and that Savior came, and His name was Jesus. Jesus promised that he would be loving and gracious and merciful, and we watched him care for every vulnerable person who came to him. Jesus Christ said he would overcome our sin, and he would bear our burdens, and we saw him do so on the cross. Jesus Christ said he could overcome death itself, and what would be torn down in three days would be rebuilt, and we see him resurrected. There's evidence of his fulfillment of promises. And so if he's told me he will be healer, if he's told me he will be provider, if he's told me he will be lover, if he's told me he will care, I will trust that he will. And I will hope and trust that on the other side, he will be there. For us today, and I know this because I know you and I have my own experiences, there are moments where the holding on to the rope of Jesus is tougher than others. The weight is heavier than others. So the friction, we feel it in our hands. And in those moments, what we can assure each other of are letters like Hebrews to people 2,000 years ago going through the same thing, going through their own struggles, going through their own doubts with faith, and them declaring to each other, deciding to each other to hold on to Jesus. And how do we know this? We have this letter, and the church has survived, and Christ Jesus has been continually worshiped and declared for 2,000 years. And if he was faithful then, he will be faithful now. Which brings us to our final group of verses. Verses 15 through 19 in chapter 3. As it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt and led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that he would not enter this rest? But to those who were disobedient. So we may see that we were unable to enter because of unbelief. He's finishing out the story of the Israelites, saying they didn't trust God in the wilderness. And so famously, he gave them 40 years to wander around, to test their faith, and for many of them to perish in the desert. He says, but those who held on, those who declared their faith, he entered into the promised land. But what I want to focus on is the language of today. Multiple times throughout Hebrews 3, he says, today. Today you will trust in this. Today you will declare. Today will be your moment. Today is present and it's significant in Hebrews. Regularly, the pastor encourages the readers to hold on to Jesus in their present work. It's not something they're waiting for in the future. If I just hunker down, eventually at the resurrection, it might be okay. I'm going to wait for that, maybe one day. No, it's a present reality. 
It's not representing faith of grandparents or parents before us who had a faith that I'm just following that faith myself and it was a faith in the past that I'm leaning on and trusting on. No, he declares, what are you going to do today? What's your decision for your life? What truth are you rooting yourself in? What do you believe about this world, about humanity, about existence and eternity? And he presents to them and he presents to us a compelling narrative about Christ Jesus, God who put on flesh and conquered death and advocates for us continually by his very blood and body. But in short, faith is present. It's present for our needs right now. It's present for our lives today. Faith is about our decision to trust Jesus now in the present. The Hebrews were in very real danger, actual danger, and they needed peace and strength right away. Not a promise of a future. He didn't write in there that, you know, perhaps 2,000 years from now, the church will survive and there will be people in New Jersey that will be worshiping and they'll have nice, comfortable seats and they'll be safe. And they would say, what's a New Jersey? What's a comfortable seat? I don't understand. Tell me right now what can help my life. The pastor says, now you can hold on and receive the strength and peace that Christ provides. I don't like the saying, your best life now because it comes with the health and wealth prosperity message that comes along with that. But I think it actually does describe it pretty accurate. That in receiving Christ Jesus, he promises our best life right now. Not just an eternity of resurrection, but fullness of life now in the present. Not health and wealth, but peace and love. I may not become wealthy, but I am rich in love by the one who made me. And in Christ Jesus, he declares me good. I may not have physical health right now, or I may face the very real threat of death, and every one of us will one day. But I believe that God can provide healing. He can do it through prayer. He can work miraculous works. And I also trust in the peace that comes from knowing that the resurrection awaits me. Others may let me down. I will let others down. But I know that the character of Jesus is one that never lets us down. I'll close with this story from the Gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 25 is a story that shows up in all of the Gospels, but I like Luke's version because of some specific language. He says, One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and they set out. As they sailed, Jesus fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake, a huge storm, so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are going to drown. He got up, and he rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided, and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? His command, he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. I've read this passage probably a hundred times, and I always sort of instinctively read it in a way that they thought they were in danger, but they weren't actually because Jesus was there, and that's what Jesus was saying to them. He was saying, you were never in danger. Where's your faith? I wouldn't let you drown. Where's your faith in me? I am watching over you, and it was in your head. The danger was in your head. It wasn't real. That's not what the passage says. The passage says they were in great danger. They were in actual danger. And so when they came to Jesus, it wasn't just in their head and Jesus wasn't mad that they didn't believe the right thing. He's mad that they didn't come sooner. You waited until this point. You waited until the ship was almost sinking. You've been up there bailing it out for hours, desperate and crying to each other. 
each other, thinking we were going to die, and you let me just sleep down here? Why didn't you come to me first? Why didn't you hold on to me, come to me, seek me in moments of need and struggle and trial? Why do we always do this? That Jesus is our last resort, not our first. I'm going to try everything else, and then if that doesn't work, I'll throw my Hail Mary pass of prayer to a miraculous Jesus. Maybe he'll come along and fix it. I have a very real process of this. And if I'm not careful, I see it rising up. And it has to do with my phone calls when I'm struggling. That I have a pattern of people I call. I call my wife. I call my sister. I call my parents. Um, and that's my order when I'm struggling and I need someone to encourage me. And it's usually somewhere between my sister and my parents, sorry, mom and dad, that God says to me, maybe you could talk to me about it. Maybe don't check off your list of people first. Can we talk about this? Can you come to me? Not just try to see if none of them answer their phone right now and they don't get back to you in five minutes when you text them that then we talk. Come to me first. Do you have faith that I am real? That I am alive and moving and working? That I am advocating for the best for you? for life in you, for peace and joy in you? Can you hold on to me when it feels like everything's swirling around you? Can you hold on to me through chaos? And will you cling to me? Jesus has done everything Jesus can do to demonstrate to us his worthiness. And he continues to demonstrate it Will we, wherever we are in our life, new to faith and asking hard questions, been a follower for a long time and asking different questions of in this phase of my life and through this struggle and trial, can I still hold on to Jesus? Can we hold on tightly to Jesus? Can you, in this moment, declare your faith in Jesus? Speak it out. Sing it out. Declare, this is how I believe the world to be because this is the God that I believe exists and has saved me and is working all things for good. What is preventing you from clinging to him? What's slipping up your hands? What's in your way? And lastly, what truth about Jesus do you need in this moment to regularly declare back into your life, to declare to others, this is what I believe about Jesus. Do you need to declare that he's good and cares? Do you need to declare that he's powerful and able? Do you need to declare that he is present and real? What do you need to declare in this moment? I wanna give you a moment to pray with me. If you could bow your heads, close your eyes this morning. If you are not a follower of Jesus today, I want to give you a chance to take a step of faith, to enter into a relationship with Jesus, to, as the author of Hebrews said, to, to grab hold of Jesus and to declare your belief in him. If you are a follower of Jesus, use this as a moment to confirm that faith and that trust. Pray this with me. Jesus, in this moment, I believe that you are worthy and you are good and you are powerful and you are able and you are caring. I believe, Jesus, that you are God and you put on flesh. You lived and continue to live as fully God and fully man. You understand everything about my life, all my weakness and challenges, yet you overcame. And I believe that you took on my sin, my shame, my death on the cross so that I could be forgiven. And that on the third day, you rose from the grave, conquering death to provide me with life now and life in eternity. Jesus, you gave your life for me. Today, I declare that I will hold on in my life following you 
gave your life to me. I give my life to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. I'll invite you, if you can, all over the room to stand with me. And I'm gonna ask you just to process with me. This altar space is open. I encourage you, if this morning there is a tug on your heart, a tug in your soul that says, I need to hold on to Jesus with a firmer grip than I have been, that I need to cling to Christ Jesus, and I need to be reminded of his goodness and his promises for me. I want to give you the space just to come to this altar and pray that out. A few of us may just pray over you and to seek Jesus, to commit again that I will hold on to you, Jesus, with all that I can. And if you need others to declare that Jesus over you, that we will gladly pray that with you, whatever your need may be this morning. As the worship team leads, this altar space is open to respond in the name of Jesus this morning.